This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and planets that you'll see overhead during April. In this episode, we'll follow the moon around the sky, spot Mercury, Venus, and Saturn before sunrise, track down a hunter, a lion, a bear, a snake, and a crow, and watch for a modest meteor shower toward month's end. Ready to explore? Then let's get started. The complete cycle of the moon's phases, called a lunation, is 29 and a half days long, just a day or two shy of an entire month. The moon moves briskly in its orbit around the Earth at about 2300 miles per hour, so from night to night it moves eastward in the sky by a little more than the width of your clenched fist held at arm's length, passing stars and planets along the way. All that motion, combined with the swelling of its sunlit shape, known as waxing, and the shrinking, called waning, will keep us on our celestial toes as we try to follow it around the sky. We start April with the moon at first quarter, which occurs on the night of April 4th, or the morning of the 5th for those of you in the Eastern Hemisphere. One week later, on the night of the 12th, that big bright ball in the sky will have moved over to the eastern horizon at nightfall and swollen to full. Northern Native Americans called this the full pink moon, because April is when a colorful species of wildflower called phlox starts to bloom. In other cultures, it's called the sprouting grass moon, the egg moon, or the fish moon. Whatever you call it, the full moon rises in the east just as the sun is setting in the west. Then, in the days afterward, the moon rises later and later, leaving the early evening sky entirely. Last quarter occurs on the night of the 21st, and you won't see this phase pop into view until after midnight. New moon follows on April 27th. Now, you can't see this phase because the moon is positioned too close to the sun. But if you could somehow, you'd see that they're very close together in the sky, less than three degrees apart. Then the moon returns to the evening sky as a lovely crescent by month's end. It seems like just a few weeks ago that we were all agog by all the bright planets and even a couple of faint ones parading together across the evening sky. Well, a lot has changed. The last planets standing, so to speak, are Jupiter and Mars. You'll find Jupiter about halfway up in the west after sunset, still quite bright and distinctive. Mars is still up there as well. You'll find it closer to overhead, pretty easy to pick out due to its slightly ruddy hue. Nearby are the twins of Gemini, Pollux, not far from Mars, and slightly dimmer Castor, a bit farther away. In early April, all three form a tight, easy-to-spot line in the sky, about as long as your clenched fist. They'll get a visit from the first quarter moon, just two degrees above Mars, on April 5th. But toward month's end, Mars starts to drift away, leaving Gemini and moving into the neighboring constellation, Cancer, the Crab. Where have all the planets gone, you ask? Well, they've swung around the sun and are reappearing low in the east before sunrise. You'll notice Venus first. It's very close to the horizon in twilight as April begins. But a couple of weeks later, it'll be much higher up and easy to spot. And by late April, Venus will be joined by two more planets. I want you to highlight Friday, April 25th on your calendar. Get up early that morning and find a nice spot with a clear view toward east, about 45 minutes before sunrise. That's about 5.15 to 5.30, depending on where you live in your time zone. Venus will be obvious, and to its lower left, by half a fist, will be a delicate, very thin crescent moon. Slide your gaze farther to the lower left, by another half fist, and you should spot Mercury. But wait, there's more. Look to the lower right of Venus, by a half fist, and you'll find Saturn. It's in the lower right corner of an equilateral triangle that includes Venus and the crescent moon. What a gorgeous grouping that will be. Let's shift back to the evening sky. It might be spring, but most of winter's bright stars are still hanging around in the hours after sunset. We'll use Jupiter to find our way around this month. High up in the west, 
a couple of fists to the upper right of Jupiter is Capella, a very bright and obvious star. Now work your way counterclockwise around Jupiter to the upper left of Capella to spot the trio of Mars, Pollux, and Castor. To their left and downward is Procyon, the anchor star for Canis Minor, the little dog. And below Procyon is brilliant Sirius in Canis Major. Now to the right of Sirius are the distinctive trio of stars marking the belt of Orion the hunter. Some months ago, when we saw the belt over in the east, it was a vertical line, but now the belt is horizontal. Above it is red-tinged Betelgeuse, and below it shines icy white Rigel. Enjoy Orion while you can. By May, it'll be too low down to spot this easily. Orion is a wintertime constellation for us northerners, and he's tipped down toward the western horizon while making a gradual exit from the evening's celestial stage. Now this month you can use Orion to observe the two ways that stars move around in our sky. The first of these is due to Earth's 24-hour spin. Find an obvious landmark along the western horizon and Orion's position with respect to it at, say, 8 p.m. Then check an hour later and you'll see that he's obviously lower down because Earth has turned. To see the second kind of motion, again note where Orion is at a particular time and then check again at the same time two weeks later. Orion will once again be farther down, but this time the cause is Earth's motion around the Sun. Our orbital position shifts over those two weeks, changing our location in space with respect to the Sun and so does Orion's location in the evening sky. Now it's time to find two cosmic carnivores. High up and almost overhead around 9 o'clock is the distinctive constellation Leo the Lion. He's facing to the right in the direction of Mars, with his head and mane forming a big backward question mark that's a little bigger than your clenched fist. At the bottom of that pattern is Leo's brightest star, Regulus, meaning Little King. You can also imagine these stars as a giant sickle, the sharp, long-bladed hand tool that farmers once used to harvest grain. Regulus, together with Castor and Pollux in Gemini and Procyon, enclose a big triangle of sky that appears fairly empty. Really, it's not. Yes, Mars is in this triangle right now, but he's an interloper for the time being. The triangle's center marks the location of Cancer the crab. This constellation isn't very big, and it doesn't have any bright stars. But here's where you'll find a nifty star cluster called the Beehive. It's not quite halfway from Mars to Regulus early in April, but by month's end, the Beehive will be just a few degrees to the red planet's upper left. In a dark sky that's free of light pollution or strong moonlight, the cluster looks like a soft glow. Binoculars will reveal dozens of individual stars here. Now let's find our old friend the Big Dipper. Look high in the north. The Dipper is positioned with its bowl at upper left and its handle curving toward lower right. According to old farmer's lore, it's upside down as if dumping April showers. The two stars at the left end of the Dipper's bowl are known as the Pointer Stars because an imaginary line down through them points almost directly at Polaris, the North Star. It's below the Pointers by about three fists. Polaris marks the handle end of the notoriously dim Little Dipper, which on spring evenings extends out to Polaris's right. Now the Big Dipper isn't a true constellation. It's what astronomers call an asterism, an obvious group of stars in some kind of pattern. The sickle is an asterism too. But the Big Dipper is part of a constellation, Ursa Major, Latin for the Big Bear. And the Little Dipper is in Ursa Minor, which means, you guessed it, the little bear. Now if you think about it, bears come out of hibernation in spring, and so the big bear is now on the prowl high in the northeast. So is Leo the lion. Okay, lions don't hibernate, but we're talking mythology here, okay? And slithering up equally high in the southeast is long winding Hydra, the sea serpent, a completely mythological creature. Hydra's stars are all pretty dim. Below Regulus by about two fists is Alfard, which forms the serpent's fiery orange heart. Its head is farther to the right, over in the southwest, and its long tail has yet to clear the southeastern horizon. Hydra was quite carnivorous in Homer's Odyssey, 
and you can think of it as a hibernator if you want. Trailing behind Leo, farther east, are two bright stars. To the line's left is very obvious Arcturus, and to its lower left is Spica, which represents the hand of the constellation Virgo the Maiden. About four fists below Leo, to the right of Spica, is a box of four medium bright stars that look something like a misshapen kite. This quartet, about a half fist across, marks Corvus the crow, and it's really distinctive. Once you spot it, you'll recognize it all the time. The stars of Corvus represented a raven to the ancient Babylonians more than 3,000 years ago. Later, the Greeks often paired Corvus and Hydra in myths involving Apollo, and you can imagine Corvus as standing on the back of Hydra. Spring is coming, and all these critters are on the march. It's been a few months since I've mentioned any meteor showers, and in fact, the first half of the year has very few of them compared to the second half. But there's one this month, called the Lyrids, that peaks on the morning of April 22nd. Astronomers use this name because these meteors appear to radiate from the constellation Lyra, the Lyre, which rises in the northeast a couple of hours after sunset and rises higher in the sky during the night and in the hours before dawn. April's Lyrids are usually weak. You might glimpse one every five minutes or so. But surprises do occur, like when sky watchers saw one per minute during an outburst in 1982. Will that happen this year too? Probably not, but you'll never know unless you watch for them. Thanks for letting me show you around the stars and planets for another month. If you want more tips for viewing the night sky, including a free interactive star chart for any time or date, check out our website, skyandtelescope.org. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find Sky Tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating or a review. It'll help spread the word about Sky Tour, and as always, I welcome your feedback. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes available at Celestron.com. Sky Tour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society, and is produced by me, Kelly Beatty. Join me next month when we'll explore the starscape near the Big Dipper in more detail. Until then, I wish you clear skies.